We have also um, some other examples as the foundation local food, working uh, especially with some projects with America Foundation for Bulgaria. Uh, the current project of this local food foundation is uh, called Pendara Mission, about local food and rural tourism. And they have a Facebook page, which is very good, presenting uh, very good practices. Uh, working with uh, the people from this uh, local food foundation, we are involved in the slow food movement in Bulgaria. Uh, in Plovdiv, we established a slow food convivium and we have some meetings and we are trying to popularize uh, this movement also in Bulgaria, especially through young people and uh, children. And talking about uh, tourism, uh, there is another project about slow tourism uh, of our regional development agency in Plovdiv, which is our partner. Uh, they have a business incubator for small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, they made a strategy for integrated slow green and healthy tourism. Unfortunately, on the regional level, this strategy is not working now, but we, are, we continue to work uh, on this issue in our living lab. And uh, in next year, working with this regional development agency, we will try uh, to provide uh, some new strategies and decisions. So about our university, if I can summarize, our mission is uh, the access to training for all and capacity building for sustainable rural development. Uh, we have uh, some interesting projects. I have chosen some of them, of course, um, they are too much and we do not have uh, so much time. But on our web page you can see the information about uh, the projects we are working on. One of uh, the projects is the EcoAgri projects about adult training course for small farmers on ecological and uh, urban agriculture. Uh, the other project is the EcoGuard project uh, about improving the qualifications of people with learning uh, difficulties in organic vegetable gardening and social entrepreneurship. And um, as I said, uh, now we are mainly working on European University Alliance Invest, Innovations of Regional Sustainability, with uh, the three main focus areas, water, energy, food and environmental nexus, quality of life and entrepreneurship, and developing our Invest Regional Living Lab uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, as part of our experience and work uh, in our university, we have uh, very good examples and we are very successful because of our staff, both uh, teachers and administrative staff and uh, our students, especially our PhD students. So now uh, I will give the floor to Delan, which is um, our PhD student, to present uh, his studies. Delan. <coughs> Hello to everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation and for that we that we can be here. Uh, you're a very good guest, a uh, very good. Um, uh, sorry, uh, you're very hospitable, and we enjoyed uh, the vis visiting of your university. So thank you. And the things that I'm going to to talk and to show you. Uh, first of all, this is the research that I made for my PhD. Uh, and this is the common agricultural policy of the European uh, Union and especially the financial risk management in the agricultural sector and uh, how to be able to manage the risk that is uh, produced by the, the consequences after the, the war in Ukraine or as we can call it the the military offensive that happened in Ukraine and what are the causes because of this because as we know Ukraine was one of is one of the major producers of uh, crops so uh, this was my um, research 
just to give you a brief um, introduction, um, I have managed to collect the data of four countries, Bulgaria, um, Croatia, Slovakia and Romania. And when I collected the data, I made some um, calculations, uh, histograms and tables and I found that the risk that is caused in the agriculture sector, especially in crops, because this was the, the main topic, uh, during the war, it is less than the risk, the financial risk on the markets before the war in Ukraine. Because when everything started, the market was closed. So when the market is closed, you're not able to sell. And when, it's, when you're not able to say, sell, there is no risk. But we saw the consequences after disclosing the markets. There was a lot of uh, crops that were collected. The producers from Ukraine was not able to sell it. And then we saw that they floated the market. And now the prices of the crops are lower than the, they was when there was the harvest last year. And this is something that uh, we can say that this is something that we were not, we didn't see the last 20 years because when there is a harvest, the prices are lowest. And then through the winter and the beginning of January and February, the prices jump double and uh, there is, it is very profitable business if you buy crops and then sell it or make them uh, or prepare them for the animals to eat. And now it's happening that if you buy it at the price, for example, one euro, now the prices are 70 cents. And this is something unusual. And now we see that the risk is going on minus. So yes, basically this is the, the main topic and the main idea. I have uh, looked at 36 months, uh, the, uh, this um, research that I made, um, I took the data on November last year. So 36 months before that, I have all the data. And uh, if you like, I can, share with you some information. There is a lot of tables, to be exact, 44 tables. And I have um, put side to side the four countries and look for this period, how are they going? What are the prices for crops? What is the percentage of income? What is the percentage of loses? The, the risk, uh, how it's increasing or decreasing? And uh, some histograms to show how it is spread, etc. Um, the main topic that I'm going to talk about is the common agricultural policy and uh, especially the sustainability uh, in Bulgaria. May I ask something? Yes, of course. The, the four countries are the main actors in the, in the crops market. Ha. Because the work is supposed to be a small and I'm not sure if they're even producing crops. Wheat, is it wheat, grain? About yes, wheat, grain and dorum. Um, so, okay, um, I have uh, looked at these uh, countries uh, because of a few factors. The first factor is when you want to do a financial uh, research, you need to have uh, data. This is the most important thing, as you know. And um, there is uh, markets that are placed in these countries uh, and they provide data. The data that I took, it is from Eurostat, and they have provided uh, through all these 36 months data on weekly base. So this is the main um, idea, idea why I took these countries, because there is, for example, from Greece, some data from uh, North Macedonia, from Italy, but they don't have all the data. So there is missing data. When there is missing, you know, you cannot give a good research, you cannot give a result. And the main idea of doing PhD is to make some results and to be able to give something to the science. Uh, and um, I was focused on the Balkans, to be honest. I wanted to look after the results for Bulgaria, Greece, uh, Romania, and if it's possible for Serbia, Serbia or not Macedonia. But as I told you, the data was missing. And when you have missing data, I have focused on the Central Europe and the Eastern Europe. Um, yes, uh, I think that I answered to the question. If you have other questions, you can ask freely, there is no problem. Um, why uh, agriculture and crops 
because I'm a producer of, I'm a young farmer, as you know, these programs that are from the European uh, um, University. So I was working this, I was doing this, but then I found that the university and the, the science is maybe the thing that I want to do in future and the slow life as we talk about the, the gastro tourism that we're going to do in Istanbul uh, next days. So yes, I noticed that this is something that we can focus and to try to be uh, producers, not only production that can be consumed by mouth, but production that can be consumed by mind. So this is something important and as I see that everyone that is here is doing this, producing something that is not only for eating, but for the mind, food for the mind, as we can say it. Um, so the things that I'm going to, to speak with you is the common agricultural policy of the European Union and how it contributes for the sustainable development of agribusiness in Bulgaria. Uh, so I think that everyone is um, familiar with the common agricultural policy that the European Union, it is um, giving us, it is for all of the members of the European Union, and what is CAP doing? It is providing uh, financial support for the producers, for the farmers, and for the people who want to do this. But uh, it is very important to understand that this is not loan for bank, this is not just financial instruments, these are uh, things that the European Union tries to do to help to the people who want to work in the agriculture sector and to be sustainable producers, as we talked early before the start of the conference. Not just to, to look what is the high value now as a production and to do it and then to change the production, but to be sustainable, to uh, produce, to be able to put from you and to be able to upgrade the production and the quality of this production that you are making. So uh, we are trying to be not only bio, but we are trying to be uh, the best as it's possible on the market, sustainable. And uh, what are the, the help that European Union gives to the farmers and the producers? These are the direct payment payments, the rural development program that they give, market support measures and knowledge transfer and advisory services. So the direct payments that we are showing at the first picture, this is uh, schemes provided financial support to the farmers that are located in Bulgaria, in our case, but in all of the European uh, countries. And it ensures their stability and facilitating investment in their agricultural activities. Uh, the payments they in, in intend to support the farmers in adopting sustainable farming practices, the thing that I mentioned earlier, and to improve the efficiency of their operations and to promote the environmental protection, something that we're looking for to not use so many pesticides, but to protect the environment because we are living in this environment. As you saw in the beginning, at the sunflowers there was bees, and without the bees, there is no agriculture. So we are trying to do the best way of agriculturing and how to improve this process. And then the rural development program. Uh, this picture is, uh, I chose this picture because there is a farmer and we cannot develop the rural areas without the farmers and without their will of doing this. So this is, the second pillar of the common agricultural policy of the European Union and it is mainly dedicated on rural development and gives a lot of um, initiatives in Bulgaria. The program uh, diversified the rural economy, exchanged the com competitiveness of the agribusiness and improved the quality of the life in the rural areas. And as you see, this project that we saw you early about the, the projects with the foods, with the food tourism and alternative types of tourism is caused by these rural development programs. They support investments in the infrastructure, innovations, 
value added processing and agritourism that is very uh, popular in Bulgaria right now and you saw what are the effects of the uh, agritourism. Then we are going at the market support measures. Uh, on so I think it's somehow different. So are we talking about subsidies or are we talking about organic farming? We are going, going for subsidies for organic farming from the Common Agricultural Policy of European it's Union. Or maybe uh, that might be weakening <coughs> the uh, farmers because as long as they get the support of the government, then they, that will be weakening them. Yes, this is the main question. So that's the discussion. Yeah, so we need the concept. We need to discuss all this. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, the problem is that uh, we uh, receive um, subsides from the government, but these are from European Union for especially organic farming, and they're looking after that. That when you receive this money, this subsidy, that you're going to do organic farming, not the conventional farming. Like the subsidies are a direct support coming from the government. Then after that, you always need that, and actually that will win the profit balance. Actually, that will be taking some of your cost away, and actually that will not be a profit, maybe exactly, because that will be spent from your taxes. So, for example, uh, talk about subsidies. United States is paying ten times more subsidies than uh, the China pays. But actually, uh, when it comes to GDP, almost the same GDP is uh, caused uh, by agriculture in both countries. So, Professor, you're saying that they are going to be dependent on these subsidies. Exactly. If yes. They are going to be dependent on the yeah. subsidies. And actually, you know, China is not paying subsidies and it's making its uh, farmers more strong, stronger. But I could have to say that I think it's not doing the same. Yeah, this is, here comes the, the other thing that I wanted to say, that if you want to learn someone how to eat, you will not give him a fish. You will teach him how to go fishing. This is what China is doing right now. Yeah. But how to know how to do organic farming without ever do this before? We're going at the slide before that, that you need to know how to do it. That's why are these subsides given from the EU to help the people to understand how to do it. And if they wish and they're able to do it, to continue doing it because the subsidies will not be everlasting or forever. Yes, but if you are talking about learning how to do something. He's talking about <coughs> getting the money even though he's not profiting. Yeah, exactly. He will continue until the subsidy. When I don't profit at all, I will stop doing it. Right? Yes. That's what dependent means. So subsidy is all about finance. It's not about learning. But before that... You're it, talking about consequence. Of course, yes, yes. But the, we are talking about the beginning. If you have subsidy, of course you will do organic farming. I, you're not stupid, yeah, of course. course. But when the sub, how are you going to be ready but, but for after subsidy? Yeah, but yourself will be able to do that. So you're, doing, you're taking subsidies and start doing organic farming. Okay, there are money from the government, you're doing this. But if you're not selling your products, what are you going to do with this? I you need subsidy. <laughs> you need subsidy, yes, but first year you're not selling everything. Uh, you're not selling. The second year, you will stop. Who is going to work something that there is no production and there is no profit from this? Okay, subsidy, but subsidy will be enough just to, to come on zero, as we can say. You're not having a profit. First year, second year, third year, you're saying, as you told me early, okay, I'm going to do potatoes. I'm going to do cherries because I'm not having the income that I'm expecting to have. So, yes, we need to be, everything needs to be balanced. Not just to take, take, but we need to give and to expect. And then, angry, angry environmental scheme subsidies. This is the other um, tool that they give us. This is a financial support for farmers implementing agri environmental practices and measures that contribute to Biodiversity conservation, soil protection, water management, and climate change mitigation. So these are the grants and subsidies that EU provides to the farmers. And this is a very different thing from the credit and financing programs. This was the main idea of these two slides to explain what they mean. The consequences after that and how to do it is a different topic. I'm looking for of the uh, part of financial uh, of finances. What is the meaning of them? Of course, 
yes. Can we get yes, yes, I'm finishing. I'm having two more slides. Yeah, okay. I'm having two more slides just to explain this. Yeah, this is very this is this is very quick. Low interest loans, everyone knows what it is, access to loans with uh, low interest. Working capital loans, you know what is this? Assistance provided for the farmers for agricultures to meet their short terms of funding requirements. And guarantees, hence it is the instruments provided for loan guarantees. Then we go to the research and development funding. And this, it is innovation grants and collabor collaborative research initiatives, I'm sorry. Uh, Reinnovation grants, it is support for researching and development projects that are connected with the agriculture that you're doing and collaborative research in initiatives. Uh, it is between the academic institutions, research organizations and agribusiness to be both working together in uh, good collaboration. And last but not least, training and advisory services that is provided it is training that uh, makes workshops and aim to improving farmers' knowledge and skills for su sustainable farming practices and farm management. And the other is advisory services that is providing farmers guidance from experts in this area on the sustainability farming techniques, business planting and market trends. Here, uh, I have, uh, we have explained what is the risk management in agriculture and basically what I told you about the, my research that I have been doing uh, because of the war in Ukraine, COVID-19 and what uh, specific uh, recommendation is having um, common agriculture policy and the measures in the financial instruments. Um, so I will give floor to the assistant professor uh, Katerina Ravska to make the conclusions and thank you for your attention from my side. So thank you, Dylan. In conclusion, I'd like to continue the discussion about the subsidies and the role of CAP. Yes, the main question is about the impact of fact and the effects on the farming and the sustainable way of doing farming and uh, the way of distorting the markets. Um, some years ago, I read an invest investigation in Greece entitled Organic Farming with, Without Organic Products. So, <laughs> uh, the question of subsidies uh, maybe can be a question of another discussion. <laughs> maybe you can come to Bulgaria or uh, some other place we can organize a panel, yeah, especially. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a very broad question, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, the very good, the best practices in Bulgaria are for farmers which do not use the support from the common agricultural policy or from the national programs. They are sustainable themselves. Of course, <laughs> undoubt, without any doubt. Just a small question, because mm -hmm. I, I, I haven't seen it before. So CSR and sustainable agriculture, how does it work? The companies invest in a farm and the produce is distributed. How is it? Because there needs to be a social part of it. And mm -hmm. how does it benefit? I, I haven't, I, do you have an example for this? I just wanted to ask you that. I have never seen a CSR in sustainable agriculture. That's why I'm asking you. I yes, yes. Yes, corporate social responsibility and even um, going to the next, uh, st uh, st the next step, uh, creating shared value in the companies. Uh, how this can ha happen in agriculture. In fact, uh, sustainable agriculture and in particular organic farming uh, we see as a mod business model applying this concept because we have a voluntary uh, application of the principles of being socially and uh, ecological contribution. These activities of CSR are applied in the agriculture too. And okay. in the organic farming enterprises, especially. There are no corporation processes. That's what he means. No corporations are involved because 
you go to that? Yes, I'm not talking about the already sustainable and organic agricultural <laughs> firms doing corporate social responsibility. <laughs> Other firms doing social. When I heard saw yeah. that, I immediately thought of a regular company doing a CSR in uh, in an agricultural, bio, uh, organic, sustainable way. Mm -hmm. But I think what you're talking about is already sustainable or already organic farm doing CSR, is it something like that? But we're talking not only doing sustainable, but uh, about these uh, initiatives of this concept, uh, considering uh, especially social and ecological issues and involving uh, the employees in these companies on a volunteer way. I, I, I just need a solid example. I haven't seen it. That's why I'm asking you, do you mm -hmm. have something that you can tell me this company is doing this and like doing it like this and this is the CSR of the company and this is the result of, of what's happening with the community. Yes, yes, of, of course, uh, these companies, uh, these enterprises and farms in Bulgaria are involved in local initiatives, uh, especially initiatives uh, considering um, the inclusion of uh, some vulnerable people in these societies, uh, especially uh, issues of um, some ecological threats and some uh, investment projects in the regions. Uh, uh, so there are many examples, but unfortunately, not uh, every one example uh, can be classified as CSR or not. It is very difficult. Even if our in our legislation, it is difficult to distinguish between the things because um, in most ways, uh, CSR is mistaken with the philanthropy or just donating. <laughs> uh, okay. So, in uh, conclusion, I promised uh, to summarize uh, what we mean with the unknown treasures of contemporary society. We see this as cultural and historic heritage, uh, nature and environment, uh, agriculture and livelihood, art and local food, crafts and folk, and uh, so on. And I'm very happy being uh, here again in Turkey because you are very close in this and we can collaborate in the future. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, we have published our research uh, in ResearchGate, so you can see more about this. And uh, here are our contacts, but I will give uh, our visit cards and my colleague Mikhail will give you some brochures about our projects. Yes, now I'd like to invite all our speakers or participants to hear yeah. and maybe no, uh, what I want to uh, make as a discussion. Um, I'll make my part of the discussion. That's why one position, why all of you here. Okay, we can give a picture. Yeah, and we can give a picture. <laughs> 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 I will take out our PCR. <laughs> The video of the municipality was focusing on that. Uh, production of quinoa. You know, quinoa mm -hmm. is more available compared to the other agricultural products. But in Turkey, everywhere, uh, something cheap, happier or whatever, uh, is cheap because it's easy uh, to cultivate all those things. Uh, okay, easy to grow those things, but actually, what happens at the end? Actually, at the end, you will not be able to create a great bill. So, uh, that is the result. So in okay. Turkey, is this employment for the whole year or seasonal? Uh, yes, uh, some of them is also seasonal. That was an important topic. Actually, when we checked unemployment rates, uh, this is about the full employment, but actually, we also have some seasonal uh, employments. Uh, when the seasonal employment is added to this one, actually, it will be much more higher. So, seasonal employment is not added to the statistics in Turkey, so that's why you cannot see the seasonal employment here. But we can only see the full employment. So, actually, what about Bulgaria? High production in the agriculture industry, it was obvious. It was uh, really uh, uh, obvious it seems uh, in the third quarter of 2022, and it was almost 10% of the total GDP. So now I'll take your comments about that. I want to ask you, what do you think about that? I think that it's about uh, 
five or six points at the doctor duty. Really? Well, actually, in 2022, as far as I heard, it's one of the highest uh, amounts uh, all in the past 40, 20 or 40 years. I'm not sure about that. Yes, Is yes. it right? It's 5.41 mm -hmm. in 2023. 5.1 mm -hmm. of total GDP. Yeah. Okay, then I'm wrong about that. But actually, about that third quarter, I'm right, right? Third quarter uh, of 22. In last years, there is a growth in agriculture in Bulgaria. Uh -huh. We are trying to find uh, the reasons and the factors of this. Um, unfortunately, the statistics, the statistics is not as in the real life. Uh, they're not reflecting the truth. Okay, so now I want to discuss something else. Raw material or adding value. You know, when it comes to agriculture, the usual thing about uh, you know uh, producing raw material. Agricultural products are usually raw materials, and uh, agriculture is not only about harvesting the products. So, uh, for example, I'll uh, give an example uh, about uh, Turkey as a nut production. Eighty-five or ninety percent of the total world as nut production takes place in Turkey. And uh, not all the Turkish people know about that, that's also uh, a shame for us. Uh, but actually, uh, when it comes to the uh, world export players, okay, Turkey is the leading uh, country, it uh, has a lot of exportation, but actually the fifth one is Germany. And in Germany, there is not even a hazelnut tree. They all buy the hazelnut from Turkey, and after that, they are export. How can our exporter can be taken at the fifth place for maybe 40 or maybe 50 years, actually. So it means that we have a potential, uh, we have a potential uh, regarding hazardous, and we're not using that. Instead, Germany is using that. So that's also another question. So I'll give an example. Uh, Cashew nut industry, India. Uh, India, actually, for years, in 2000, actually, it was a leading country on uh, cashew nut export. But India was uh, quite uh, aware of that uh, when they process their cashew nuts, uh, actually they'll have an advantage. So here, for example, uh, Brazil actually was the first uh, place that harvested cashew apple, and there are some other complicated things, you know. Uh, it's very weird to say that, but a uh, nut grows uh, after uh, the fruit, at the cashew nut tree. So if you collect the uh, fruits, then actually you do not have uh, nuts. So that's why uh, you have to wait for uh, the fruit to be rotten, and after that, the cashew nuts uh, will be growing. And after that, there are also some very uh, sensitive, uh, very uh, difficult processes. Actually, uh, first, the cashew nut, uh, if we measure it before the nut, we said about that. And actually, uh, in the 1920s, India developed the cashew nut uh, processing industry, and since 1920s, India is working on it. And it's a very uh, difficult process. Actually, you need to use your bare hands, and uh, the cashew nuts uh, must be very hot during the time. And when uh, you're breaking it, you must be very careful about that. And when you uh, get the skin of cashew nut, you cannot use your nails. So forget about using a knife or other things, you cannot even use your nails and think about it, it's very hot. And it determines the quality of cashew nut. And what about the price of it? The price can be double or triple or maybe five times or six times more if you um, take care of this process very carefully and successfully, then the price will be really increasing. I'll discuss about that again and how can a cashew nut production uh, be changing in time. Okay, so highest growth left with China because they thought that uh, they really wanted their eager for it and they don't have enough because in China every person uh, eats four or five hazelnuts in a year. So they thought that it's a great market, but the Chinese people they hate hazelnuts. So <laughs> after that experience, over five times, one, four or five, five pieces. pieces, four or five pieces every. Okay. Yeah. Multiply with the population. <laughs> what they hate, they hate it. They, uh, they hate the hazelnuts. They, instead, they want uh, to eat uh, Chesterfields, Kestane, uh, and raw. So we hate to eat that raw, but Chinese people eat it raw. So our taste are totally Because hazelnut yeah. is an aphrodisiac and China don't need such an aphrodisiac. <laughs> <laughs> because of population. 
I don't know. Well, I'm going to India. India has surpassed India. India, uh, they have as a lot, and the name of the government. If I government, I prohibit the import of hazelnuts. No, uh, India was really eager about it, and there was a great potential in India. But instead of India, they tried China. And India, uh, it's called Findak, and in Turkey, we call it Fındık. The taste is similar, even the sound is similar. So uh, it was the wrong market, for example. So, uh, you know, agriculture should be uh, evolved together with the marketing. So in Turkey, we have another agriculture, the best, the highest production of hazelnut. But what about marketing? Uh, we have this public in Turkey, which is responsible for it. And it's not that successful of marketing. Instead of India, it's right, China. So why? Because it has higher population. Yeah, not federal Russia. Huh? Federal Russia is buying the most days in North India. Federal Russia? Yeah, now they are the partner of Discovery League. Now actually, uh, we should be dominant on them and uh, we should be determining prices, but now they are inside Discovery League and they are determining. So, okay, I'm not talking about that anymore. Uh, okay, so India, there was a high demand in Brazil and in other countries, especially when it comes to export, if there's a low demand, then they'll have an advantage. But actually, I will uh, talk about the newcomers. Okay, during the 1990s, uh, actually Vietnam was a newcomer. And actually, uh, they had a good competition with India, uh, Vietnam and India. And Vietnam tried to uh, use high-tech uh, techniques uh, to uh, produce uh, cashew nuts. At the beginning, it worked. They use a high-tech technology, but they notice that high grades cannot be uh, produced with high-tech technology because, as I told you, you need to use your bare hands. Uh, so that's why they decided to make a segmentation. And that segmentation in Vietnam, did it work or not? Uh, we'll talk about that. And Vietnamese exports are uh, of high quality and uh, the country's exporters are uh, United States and China, which was the customers of India in the past. But now uh, they prefer to buy cashew nut, especially China, from Vietnam. Uh, because actually, uh, in China, they prefer the highest quality cashew nuts. They love cashew nuts in China, and the highest quality is being sold to China. Uh, usually, the uh, market price is $2 or something. But in China, if you have high quality cashew nuts, you can sell it for $7, uh, 9 or even $10. And uh, Vietnam is doing that. And today, let's check the newcomers. Uh, Vietnam is the largest cashew nut producer. So as you can see, you don't need to uh, grow a cashew nut tree for 40 or 60 years, just like we grow all the trees. Uh, that's why they have a chance. Uh, Vietnam is not the largest uh, cashew nut producer. Ivory Coast uh, is the largest uh, cashew nut producer. Vietnam is the largest exporter. I'll talk about that. Ivory Coast has a great amount, and India comes after that. And Vietnam, uh, it's only 283, and now checking about the uh, statistics, some other places show it different, but actually uh, the one I, I could find is about that, but this way or that way, it takes place at the third place. And what about the exporters? Now, you can see that Vietnam, when it comes to value, has the highest uh, amounts earned during export, and is the largest exporter. Ivory Coast is the second, and India it takes place at the third. So, sure, but maybe the India has a big demand inside the exactly. country. That's why. It's That's why I put an emphasis on this land. Go so, ahead, you got it. Thank you very much. Actually, there is a great demand in India. Uh, the local demand actually determines the export and the high population. Of course, and after that, uh, India takes place at the third place. But actually, when you check uh, the amount of production. And uh, the value created during export, actually India sells its cashew nuts uh, two or three dollars per kilo. Actually, yeah. And Ivory Coast uh, is uh, also changed between two dollars and five dollars. In Vietnam, it's also five dollars uh, per ton. And amount of export, we can check it from here. Ivory Coast has the highest amount, Vietnam has the second highest, and India takes place at the third place. So, uh, if I have added that to here, when you check it here, highest quality comes from Vietnam, and the difference, uh, the 
uh, surplus made by Vietnam comes from the cash reserves sold to China. As you can see, uh, its average value is uh, seven dollars, seven thousand two hundred and twenty-three dollar uh, per ton. It is seven, approximately seven dollar per kilogram, something like that. So, what do you think about that? Quality or amount? Which one is more important? I think quality uh, makes a difference, especially today, because uh, in the past we were taking on agricultural perspective. What is agricultural perspective? Produce more, manufacture more, but it's not like that. Today we have an economic perspective, a financial perspective. So what we produce, does it have a value? Is it uh, making a higher profit or not? You don't need to produce in higher and greater amounts. You can produce in smaller amounts, but actually the profit might be very high. So, uh, for example, when it comes to saffron and some other products, it's exactly like that. And talk about the subsidies. Uh, France is usually uh, criticized about the subsidies uh, by the European Union and other countries because actually uh, the share of GDP in uh, France is it's changing between 1% and 2%. And, uh, in 2020, it was. Dimitrov uh, 30 years ago uh, through the example of a college from the UK. So we were the, the pioneers in Bulgaria in um, founding uh, the agricultural science and going in a new way in the agriculture in Bulgaria. Uh, starting with this project, we grew up and now we are, we are the biggest private school in Bulgaria, training specialists in the field on agribusiness and sustainable rural development. And uh, now we have um, around 4,000 students. We are small, uh, smaller than your <laughs> university. <laughs> uh, but um, we are going in a sustainable way. And um, three years ago, we entered in an European University Alliance uh, called Innovations of Regional Sustainability. So now we are part of this European University. I will tell you more during the presentation. Uh, so now uh, me and my colleague Delan, we will talk about agribusiness and sustainable rural development in Bulgaria. Uh, in a way, uh, we see these processes in our country and uh, what are our best practices, how we are doing. Uh, first, uh, we will stress on the sustainability trends and challenges in contemporary world and especially about on the development of rural regions um, in Bulgaria as part of the European Union. We are talking about the European Green Deal and the strategy farm to fork. And um, the next uh, points in our presentation will put the focus on the sustainable agri-food systems, our expertise in this field, and um, especially uh, developing local businesses uh, in Bulgaria and sustainable business models presenting some good practices and the experience and the results of the study of my colleague Delian Plachkov, uh, who is a PhD student. And uh, next week, uh, on the 19th of May, is his defense. <laughs> so we will wish him good luck. 
And uh, finally, we'll conclude about um, what we see as the unknown treasures of our contemporary society. I hope uh, the presentation will be interesting to you, but if you have any questions, you can interrupt me anytime. Don't worry, because um, I suppose it will be a discussion, not just a lecture. <laughs> <clears throat> so, starting with the topical challenges in the modern world, um, my uh, preferred question is about the globalization. Some of my colleagues uh, said now after COVID we are talking about globalization more than about globalization, but uh, globalization trends tend and um, they will continue as such, and especially the impact on economic, social and ecological aspects of uh, sustainable development, especially regarding our cultural development. Mm. And uh, we saw that the humanity faced uh, the biggest challenges uh, that has ever faced in his hi history. Uh, and uh, if we think about sustainable development now from the point of view after passing these pandemics of COVID and uh, the climatic changes and their impact on uh, our life and earthquakes, etc., uh, we can think uh, about uh, the issue of uh, sustainability in a different way. Uh, one of um, the questions uh, uh, is... Uh, connected to sustainable consumption and production and sustainable use of natural resources, which are the main factors uh, in our future development. Uh, so we are trying to establish our knowledge-based economies, uh, our data-driven economies, etc. We have um, our smart specialization strategies. Uh, we are talking about innovation, entrepreneurship, small and medium sized enterprises development. But how we can do all this? Uh, in order to do this, we can start, of course, with the sustainable, de sustainable development, uh, sustainability, sustainable development goals, and uh, the notion of the global partnership. Uh, if uh, we should decide these global challenges to the whole world, uh, we should unite all. These are not questions uh, to be decided just by, by one country, one region. We should be all in this way. Uh, so, uh, in this uh, way, the system of education is, and training maybe is the most important. Uh, the system in which uh, we make our research and uh, propose some innovations for these uh, questions and their decision for sustainable future. And um, in talking about this, our role working in universities is uh, very crucial. Uh, so, uh, talking about this sustainable development, I think that we should not also talk about uh, economic, uh, ecological aspects and social aspects as a whole, but uh, mostly about the cultural aspects. We should change our minds and we should start from our children even. Uh, building our sustainable societies uh, which will be not an easy task, of course. But we should start from somewhere and uh, this uh, should be our driving point. Uh, sustainability as an issue is very important for some regions, of course, uh, but we cannot divide and uh, make it uh, in a contraposition. Uh, we are talking about rural regions because they face uh, many challenges and problems, especially about uh, demographic processes, infra bad infrastructure, lack of investment, uh, the big rate of unemployment, uh, human resources and capacity development, which are the very big needs in uh, this region. And uh, talking about rural regions, uh, we are usually have an idea about the agriculture and food in these regions. Uh, 
also tourism. Integrating agriculture and tourism is the way of making uh, these sectors and rural regions again back to the life, especially in Bulgaria. Uh, the poverty in uh, rural regions uh, is also one of the main problems and it is connect is, uh, connected uh, also to the questions of training and education. So in our university we are trying to make the necess all the necessary activities in order to provide uh, these sections for capacity building in rural regions uh, to, aid, to train people in a way that uh, they uh, can uh, make own businesses and uh, earn incomes so that uh, to improve the quality of life. Uh, we are stressing on the four uh, moments of sustainable development, people, planet, partnership, peace and prosperity. I noticed the European Green Deal, just a few words about that, um, because still under discussion, this is um, this stays our strategy for the future in the European Union and in Bulgaria too, striving to be the first climate neutral continent and uh, to uh, present effective decisions uh, for making this a real, not just a strategy, a plan, but after some years uh, you can say, yes, we succeeded in this. So. Um, we have some priorities about new jobs, uh, cleaner environment, better quality of life, uh, zero pollution, um, energy effectiveness, etc. And uh, all this can be happen, I again would like to stress, uh, with uh, the sustainable agri-food systems. The strategy from farm to fork is at the center of the European Green Deal and human health and well-being through sustainable agri-food systems. Uh, this strategy is uh, oriented towards a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food system. Uh, so we have no choice between enough nutritious, affordable food for every one person and uh, protection of our planet for our future generations. Uh, we would like to have uh, healthy people, societies and uh, planets and uh, to create new opportunities uh, not only for uh, producers but for consumers and uh, the whole um, chain, agri-food chain. Uh, building the food chain that works for consumers, producers, climate and the environment uh, is not an easy task and it needs uh, human and financial investment, uh, new green business models, um, renewable energy and uh, new decisions, uh, application of the principles of circular and bio-based uh, industry, etc. In uh, all these um, questions, uh, we are talking about uh, how to stimulate sustainable food processing, wholesale, retail, hospitality and food services, uh, how to promote sustainable food consumption and uh, this shift to healthy, sustainable diets, uh, how to reduce uh, food loss and waste, how to combat uh, food fraud along the food supply chain. And uh, sustainable agri-food uh, systems, um, of course, uh, include the questions of environmental impact, climate change, biodiversity, food security, nutrition and public health, uh, fair trade. But um, I chose this picture because in the center is the food communication. It is very important to talk about uh, these questions about the food communication, as you will see in the next slides of the presentation. Uh, talking about sustainable agriculture and sustainable rural development, um, we are thinking about uh, 
uh, model uh, which is um, very popular now in Bulgaria and in Europe and um, we had some also had some projects in Turkey about organic production and organic farming uh, we saw this as uh, not as um, only as a priority in our rural development policy uh, it's more about uh, way of thinking uh, a new holistic approach in management of agriculture trade and food enterprises um, in our studies, in our university, we present the organic production as a business model of uh, corporate social responsibility and having a great potential for sustainable development. Uh, so, uh, when uh, studying all these questions, and especially organic uh, farming and integration of all these activities with alternative tourism practices, uh, we are investigating um, the rural entrepreneurship and in particular uh, social entrepreneurship in agriculture in Bulgaria, uh, the cooperation and funding opportunities which can foster innovation and sustainability in agri-food chain, uh, chains and um, establishment of a new agricultural knowledge and innovation system which uh, should be a market-oriented system. In our university, um, we have a living lab. Uh, we use this concept of the living labs as open innovation intermediaries, which involve uh, all the interested uh, parties, all the stakeholders, including consumers, the final uh, uh, point in the chain, and um, we uh, study all these opportunities uh, in Bulgaria, how to develop and, uh, this, uh, and to contribute to these questions and to sustainable development. Before going to the good practices from Bulgaria, I would uh, present some uh, interesting facts about Bulgaria. Uh, the agriculture takes uh, the half of the country territory in Bulgaria, and the rural municipalities uh, are over 80% in Bulgaria. But also Bulgaria ranks third place for cultural and historical uh, heritage in Europe after Italy and Greece by number and diversity of cultural and historic monuments. So uh, we have a great potential and the main question is how to use this potential and utilize this in the best way. Encouraging local businesses in rural regions um, is uh, the main topic in our research in our university. Here uh, we are oriented toward uh, the so-called alternative food networks as uh, spatial and social transformations which we can make in our rural regions and some of the questions are connected to community-supported agriculture, which um, in comparison to the USA, of course, says some good practices, is not so well developed in Bulgaria, and we have some problems implementing this practice. But on the other side, um, we are working very successfully towards farmers' markets in Bulgaria. Uh, farmers' markets as a business model encouraging sustainable production and consumption, as incubators of local businesses for sustainable rural development, as, uh, and a sustainable business model for rural development. In um, this development, we are relying on the, on the activities of community centers in Bulgarian villages. Our community centers um, are very active now and uh, supporting these processes because we are trying uh, to get people back to the, our villages to feel the culture, the traditions and to work for the revival of our villages. Uh, these are pictures from uh, feast of pepper, tomato and traditional food and crafts in a small village near Plovdiv. 
and um, during uh, the feast we had a discussion entitled tomatoes do not grow in crates in boxes someone should produce <laughs> tomatoes <laughs> um, on the pictures you can see uh, our students um, the lady um, there uh, is our student um, and uh, his and her father and also people from the village uh, working uh, towards um, sustainable development of this region which is not uh, so easy but uh, they are all devoted to this and each year making this festival they show to all um, that uh, things could happen if they unite and they are together uh, during um, this uh, event, um, they present Bulgarian folk, crafts and more, all that we can present from our villages and attract more people, of course. Uh, talking about Bulgarian villages, um, you can see also many legends about heroes, uh, masters, about Bulgarian roses, uh, of course. <laughs> Uh, our nature, architecture, museums, etc. In our university, um, we are working uh, for the so-called so slow life. Uh, going back to the villages and slow down. No, no, no. Maybe they didn't apply because yes, we did not apply. It's very common <laughs> to apply. Mm -hmm. I know from Iznik. I, I go to Iznik a lot. Iznik is a small cheetah, for instance, but there are many other uh, small places. Yes, and uh, about the Bulgarian countryside, uh, there is a say uh, in internet. You could not forget it. This is another Bulgaria. Uh, I chose these uh, pictures from one village uh, also near Plovdiv. The village is called Staro Zilizari. This is the village of art and the individualities. These are the pictures on the walls of the houses, the old houses. These pictures were made by international the students. The right after picture? More of China? <laughs> <laughs> Pictures are very interesting because they are made of uh, international students coming from all over the world each summer. They come to this village and people um, provide their houses, the wall, of their the wall of their houses for these paintings. There are many paintings and um, on the door of this old house you can see MoMA entrance. MoMA is the Museum of Modern Arts in New York. <laughs> so uh, they moved this museum in the village. <laughs> in uh, this village, uh, we made some studies about the food as an expression of culture. Because they say, the people in this village say that you will not stay hungry in this village. <laughs> Uh, the food is uh, not only a uh, business, but only an expression of culture. This looks like um, more than agriculture. Yes. It looks like gospel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> we call all this alternative to our reason. <laughs> yeah, we, we also say something about it. We visit almost all cities in Turkey nowadays, our people for uh, eating kebab and other mm -hmm. uh, regional foods. It's also very uh, spread in Turkey. You go by plane in the morning, you go eat something, and then after another, another, another. So six, seven times eating something during the day, no? Yeah. Going around the city, finding the best uh, taste. Yeah, just eat. Yes. Yeah. In Istanbul, I usually eat very less food, but mm -hmm. when I go to visit other cities, I don't feel satisfied, I eat everything. <laughs> you should try everything. 
the food stood very delicious. Mm -hmm. I remember been being to Bulgaria. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, you should I come. visit other Balkan countries uh, in uh, next month. Uh, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Macedonia. Then our later project will be Bulgaria. <laughs> you should come. You're welcome. Okay. And uh, don't forget to write an email. I will give you a, a visit card later. <laughs> Addresses. Yes. We, take the addresses. we will take you to these villages and many more interesting yes. places. Yes. <laughs> Another good practice is a big project called the New Thracian Gold. The New Thracian Gold is nature, agriculture, and tourism. These three elements are the New Thracian Gold in this project. And uh, we have a guest house called Tepavicata in the eastern Rodops, the, in the mountain. Uh, the housekeepers are a man and a woman uh, with great hospitality, our partners of our university. Uh, so this is a very good practice which continues even after the end, the end of the project. The financing finished, but the practice continues. <laughs> Another good practice about cooking and crafts is um, the so-called Deshka guest house. Deshka is the name of the woman founded uh, this business. And uh, here uh, people, and especially children, come to see Bulgarian uh, traditions, uh, to um, try some cooking, uh, some crafts, uh, singing, dancing, etc. So uh, this is very popular, especially in YouTube. There are many uh, videos in YouTube and very popular in Bulgaria, Deshka House. Uh, another good practice uh, is uh, the cooperative called Hram Coop. Uh, co cooperative of agricultural producers, uh, which mission is the access to clean food. Unfortunately, uh, these practices are not so spread in Bulgaria, and Bulgarians um, are not used to cooperate. But now um, we are trying uh, to expand these practices because uh, the small producers will not survive if they do not cooperate. And uh, Hran Coop is a very good example of this. Near Plovdiv, uh, there is a small uh, village um, and a farm with goats bred with love. This farm is called Halalica. This woman is the founder and uh, she is our partner too.